rent because what the area that they agreed to lease was now smaller by one bedroom. So you can change the lease and alter it. Now we have this thing again, and we're back to this term called a sublease and an assignment. So over here, here's the landlord and they lease to, no, they don't. They don't lease to another landlord. They lease to tenant one. It is sometimes where tenant one may get in trouble and they want to sublease to tenant two. And they could sublease the entire property or they could sublease a portion of it. And you see this in commercial where tenant one may rent a 5,000 square foot warehouse and then their business slows down. So they take a tenant two and sublease one of the back rooms so that tenant two does shipping out of the back room and tenant one <clears throat> does out of the front portion of this warehouse they lease. Or the tenant could completely vacate and the new tenant come in uh, as uh, the whole property. Here's the problem with subleasing. If tenant one subleases to tenant two and tenant two fails to pay, tenant one is still on the hook. All right. You will see right here, there is no contractual obligation, meaning the landlord and tenant two didn't sign a lease so the landlord cannot sue tenant two because the first thing the judge is going to say is let me see your contract and they're going to say don't have one then you can't really sue them all right so a sublease is when a tenant finds a tenant okay that's typically the definition now, on the scale of grand stupidity, I think this is number one. Slightly above this is where tenant two assumes tenant one's lease or tenant one assigns their lease to tenant two. Quick refresher, what's an assignment? An assignment, remember, is when the contract stays the same and the parties change. So tenant two would get assigned the lease. Now, if tenant two fails to make a payment, there is a contract because tenant two assumed the obligations of tenant one, the landlord could go after tenant two in a case like that. So you have this sublease and you have an assignment of the lease. Now, I may be erroneously said on the grand scale of stupidity, subleasing is always, always, always probably not a good thing. Assuming the lease or assigning it to a new tenant may be a good thing, depending on what the lease says for tenant on tenant one. <clears throat> if you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. If the landlord has tenant one on a market rate that is higher than the market, the landlord may want tenant two to assume tenant one's lease. You see what I'm saying? Because if he has to write a new lease, it would be at this lower market rate. So there could be some times when the assumption or the assignment, depending on how you look at it, is a valid way to get tenant two into the spot and tenant one out of the spot 
by assigning the leads from one to two. All right. Thumbs up. Over on the top of the next page, leases like to get recorded. Remember, we can record stuff and we talked about that. Tenants should record a lease. That way there's never any question in case you have to go to court. You can literally say, well, your honor, here's the lease signed by so-and-so, acknowledged, we had it notarized, I entered it into a recording. So there's no question as to which lease is valid because this is the one that got recorded. In Indiana, any lease longer than three years has to be recorded. Now, don't get confused. I do not mean a one-year lease that gets keep get, getting renewed. I mean a lease from the outset that defines a three-year or greater time period should get recorded, all right? And as a landlord, there is a reason you want it recorded beyond a court issue. If you think back to the mortgage, and we talked about this alienation clause, if you alienate yourself from the property, they could call the loan due. Well, if you sign a lease, and the bank drives by three years in a row and they're like, hey, dude, we've seen somebody else in that property. You have alienated yourself. We're going to call the loan due. And you're like, no, 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 no. I still own the property. I leased it to that company. And they're like, really, can you prove that? As a matter of fact, I can. I recorded this 10 year lease. So I haven't really alienated myself. I'm still involved, still have an interest, still financially obligated. So the landlord may want it recorded for protection, believe it or not, against his lender. So his lender will not claim that they have alienated themselves. There's another clause on page 334 called the non-disturbance clause. I'm here to tell you I have never seen this clause in a residential mortgage or a residential lease. These are used extensively inside of commercial leases. And what a non-disturbance clause is this. If the commercial landlord gets himself into some financial problems with his lender and the lender may decide to foreclose on the investor that owns the property, the, <clears throat> the tenant will have the right to exercise their non-disturbance clause and tell the bank, hey dude, you're fighting with the landlord? That's cool. Don't involve us. Matter of fact, we will pay our lease directly to the bank and don't kick us out. This happened with a marsh there in Southside Indianapolis where the landlord got into some trouble and marsh exercised their financial or their non-disturbance clause that said, you want to foreclose upon him, go ahead. We're going to continue to stay here because we've spent millions of dollars in advertising and marketing and community welfare. We don't want to get evicted out of this building because our landlord's doing something stupid. So we will pay our rent directly to the bank. And don't disturb us. Everybody get it? Leave me out of the fight. You guys want to fight? Go ahead, Shauna. How, how long can you execute a um, non-disturbance clause? It would be defined in the lease, but oh, okay. typically most of them say you can exercise the non-disturbance clause until the issue gets rectified. Either they foreclose and sell the property 
or the landlord becomes current and back in good graces. And then the tenant will say, okay, we are removing that. And now we'll go back to paying the landlord. You can do it indefinitely until whatever's going on over there solves itself. In the case of the marsh, what they did is they exercised it indefinitely until the new investor came in and bought the building. And then they created a new lease with the new investor. And I know this because I brokered the deal. All right. I brokered the sale of the building to the new investor and Marsh stayed in as a tenant until their 15 years were up and then they exercised their right to terminate the lease and they actually moved the Marsh somewhere else. And if you guys think back to the Marsh located at Smith Valley in 135, it was attached to, at the time, Kmart, I think. Now it's a Chevy store and the farm, you guys know what I'm talking about? 31 and Smith Valley. It's that marsh with the big glass dome on it. Okay, it doesn't matter. That marsh is now gone because they built a new building over on 135 and moved that one over there, but it took them three years to do that. All right. I have never seen these in a mortgage for residential or a lease for residential. All right. Now, we talked about an option before. An option is the right to do something in the future based upon terms we're going to agree to today. In the leasing world, there are three or four different options that you have. And Shauna, you touched on one of these earlier is what's called the renewal option. The renewal option. It's the option typically based upon the tenant that gets to renew their lease as long as the tenant is in good standing, which if you think about it, makes sense. If I'm a landlord and I've got a tenant that is in good standing, meaning they're paying on time, they're not behind, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, why would I not want that tenant to renew? They're a good tenant. In our lease at the school, that is how our renewal option states. As long as the tenant is in good standing, it is my discretion to renew the lease. Landlord says, if you're in good standing, Go ahead, renew it. We don't care. We'd rather keep you in it than it go dark and we have to release it and spend time and effort. So the renewal option is typically at the tenant's discretion as long as they're in good standing. Now, if they want to exercise the renewal and they're five months behind and all of this problem, the landlord's going to go, no, you cannot renew that because you are not in good standing. I want to terminate this, get you out get a new tenant in, all right? We also have this thing called a pure option, which we've discussed before. That's the right to purchase property that we agree upon today. Remember, it was the only unilateral contract we use. It's a purchase option. Sometimes you hear the word pure option. Then there's this other one that landlords may give to a tenant called the right of first refusal. The right of first refusal. This allows the tenant to get first chance at buying the property if the landlord is going to sell it, all right? So if the landlord says, hey, I've decided I want to sell this building, he, may, he would go to the tenant and go, look, market value is 1.1 million. Do you want to buy it? And the tenant says, yes, I want to exercise my first right, which gives me the first chance to look at it. Yes, I'll buy the building and now I will own the building I'm in. Or the tenant could say, no, I really just want to be a tenant. I don't want to own it. Go ahead. And the landlord says, okay, I'm going to take this building to market 
sell it and you're going to get a new landlord. All right. 